From All Saints Anglican Church in Ottawa, the funeral cortege of the late Lieutenant General Kenneth Stewart, CB, DSOMC, proceeds to Beechwood Cemetery. A battalion of the RCR forms the Guard of Honor. A 15-gun salute is fired by a battery of the Royal Canadian Horse Artillery. High-ranking officers of Canada's Navy, Army, and the Air Force, and other prominent officials accompany the casket on the way to its last resting place. In traditional manner, the General's black charger follows in the procession as muffled drums beat the tempo of the slow march. Graveside ceremony is conducted by Honorary Brigadier Canon C.G. Hepburn, former principal Protestant chaplain of the Canadian Army. A former chief of the general staff, General Stewart was one of Canada's most distinguished soldiers. His passing is mourned by the nation as a great loss to the Canadian Army. The latest contribution to the field of journalism in the Canadian Army goes to press. It is the weekly sheet titled Gunner. It is published by and for the boys of the artillery brigade of the CAOF. The editor is Battery Sergeant Major Taylor, who looks over the copy before it goes to the makeup room. The linotypes and other machinery are made in Germany. Once they turned out propaganda for the Crooked Cross, now they dish out weekly doses of sports, local and worldwide news for the edification of the lads behind the guns. Chief Lieutenant Colonel Telford gives the once over to the week's edition as it rolls hot off the press. Bearing the date line, Jeeva, Germany, the edition goes into the hands of the circulation department. High speed distribution is affected by a Jeep as the Gunner Newsboys peddle their papers. Supplementing the Maple Leaf with news of local character, the Gunner is well received by arty types of the CAOF. In a modern nylon yarn mill at Kingston, Ontario, production is starting on the precious thread for civilian uses. New additions have been made to the mill to handle the increased volume of material in demand. During the war, the entire output was used in the making of parachutes and other gear for the Air Forces of the United Nations. Now the rolls of thread go into the making of those luxuries so dear to the feminine heart, full-fashioned nylon stockings. The output of the nylon mill goes to the hosiery manufacturers, where a handful of the thread makes one pair of stockings, which are, according to the ads, as light as a feather and as sheer as a dream. In case you plan to wear them while scrubbing the floor or doing setting up exercises, don't worry, they really stretch. If it so happens that you've forgotten what nylons really look like, well, just concentrate on these. Is there a 
a doctor in the house? There's a quack over there going green with envy. With the housing shortage acute in industrial areas, some Toronto families are building their own, bricks and all. Although they know little or nothing about the art of construction, they fall to with a will to learn by the hard method of experience. All the families pressed into service. Ma learns to become a first-class cement mixer, while the head of the household lays the bricks. It may be a tough job, but it certainly brings results, and it's far better than riding the house-hunting merry-go-round. One home is built by a family in their spare time between shifts in the factory. The house-building bug has also bitten Junior. Even the family pooch will have a nice warm home when the snow begins to fly, thanks to the initiative of Toronto's amateur home builders. In British Columbia, units of Canada's fifth biggest business go all out to beat the scarcity of food in Britain. Members of the salmon fishing fleet, the largest professional fishing fleet in the world, prepare to make record catches. Nets cost $2,000 a set, so they are treated with plenty of care. The greatest of all salmon fisheries are found among the thousand islands, bays and rivers which make up the British Columbia coastline. The fishing boats, each carrying a crew of seven, set sail for the happy hunting grounds. Leaving at four in the morning and returning at ten at night, the little boats, they have a busy day. Piscatorial jackpot is hit and the holes are filled up to the brim with the salmon sandwiches of tomorrow. At the canneries, the fish are put on the production line. Every part of the salmon is used, except the wiggle, to produce food and byproducts. From the time the fish is taken out of the water until the time it is reduced to a tin of red salmon is exactly 24 hours. This year, salmon output has been increased by 200% over 1944. 80% of the total output goes to the British Ministry of Food. With meat rationing in the Dominion swelling the tonnage, Canada goes all out to keep UK larders filled with food. Due to Allied bombing, destruction caused by the retiring Wehrmacht, and the general havoc of war, the internal communication system of Germany was practically demolished. Food and supplies for the defeated nation suffered badly. One of the first tasks of the occupying forces was to rebuild the major method of transportation, the railways. Engineers of the United Nations get to work and use their wartime skill and ingenuity in the reconstruction of Germany's peacetime lines of steel. Jerry railway men, familiar with the system, are pressed into service. Slowly the right-of-way becomes again operational. In Friesland, after many months of work, the main line is open. Flour from Western Canada is unloaded to relieve the acute food shortage. Displaced persons as well as natives see the difference by their shop windows. The lifeline of a demolished country now operates to relieve the congestion of traffic caused by the exodus of displaced persons and the importation of food. Under Allied occupational supervision, the railways of Germany now are commencing to function. 
thus wartime training aids in the rehabilitation of a defeated nation.